Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. last lecture we were discussing the uh, instrumental variable technique so which is basically uh, again going back to causality in the absence of an experiment when you cannot set up an experiment we were trying to see what are the available econometric tools that can be still utilized on observational data to retrieve the causal parameter uh, when you are for instance interested in a relationship of x on y the causal relationship of x on y. So, we will take, so what we learnt in the previous lecture was to, uh, uh, was we had a general description of uh, what an instrumental variable is and the historical context in which the uh, use of instrumental variable started which is the typical demand supply framework where you are interested in estimating the demand elasticity. Right. The, so, the what we are interested in here is the effect of price, a change in price on quantity demanded. And we uh, saw how you can use a supply shifter on an observational data where you have data points which are equilibrium points of price and quantity demanded, how you can use supply shifters to actually retrieve the causal effect of a price change on quantity demanded even in the presence of a uh, reverse causality that is a feedback effect from quantity demanded to price changes. And uh, what we also discussed are the two most important assumptions for a, for, a, for, a, for a particular variable to serve as an instrumental variable and these assumptions were the assumptions of exogeneity which is also the exclusion restriction as we discussed and also the assumption of relevance which is that the instrumental variable must be correlated to the explanatory variable in use. So, what we are going to start with today is to see alternate ways in which we can understand the derivation of the instrumental variable estimator. So, the IV estimator can be written as beta i v. So, this beta i v is the estimate of beta, the true estimate or the i v estimates let us say for the time being and uh, z here is the instrumental variable itself and x is the explanatory variable that we are interested in. Now, what we start with is the typical regression of x and y and we are interested remember in this coefficient estimate beta. Typically what we do is we estimate this using the OLS ok. So, where beta hat OLS can be written as x transpose x inverse x transpose y ok. So, now find the analogy between this OLS estimator and now that we are using the uh, relationship between or the covariance between x and z to actually estimate the true parameter beta in the situation where x and u are correlated, where the expectation of u given x is not equal to 0. In that case, what we are saying is instead of this estimator, we have the IV estimator which uses the relationship between x and z to find out the relationship between y and x. So, this estimator provides an unbiased estimate of beta in the linear model y equal to beta x plus u. So, once again we are just uh, digressing from the model with the uh, constant term alpha, but remember that this model subsumes the one um, or, or, the, or the model with alpha actually subsumes this model which is a mean deviation model. So, not much of a difference in that sense. So, once again the, this estimator provides an unbiased estimate of beta in the linear model y equal to beta x plus u. If z is correlated with x, so we want this z prime z transpose x term to be not equal to 0 and uncorrelated with u which is z and u must be uncorrelated. Now, there are several ways to understand the derivation of this estimator. 
the very first one we will take a very um, intuitive uh, derivation over here. So, suppose uh, we are interested once again in the effect of work hours on productivity. Does um, additional work hours lead to or additional effort work hours here can be uh, also thought of as effort. So, whether additional effort leads to uh, lead to higher productivity. Um, so, to make it more specific let us consider the example of um, uh, class attendance. So, suppose we are talking about uh, suppose I teach a class of 50 students in a, a particular session and what we are saying here is that the student who actually uh, gives more effort in class may be more attentive in class or attends more of the lectures during a particular term is a student who is also more productive. Now, you can think of uh, measuring productivity for instance in the performance of the student in this particular course. So, this is one example that you possibly can readily um, relate to because you are al also attending this particular class and what I am saying here uh, saying here is that how attentive you are while listening to my lecture determines what your performance would be or how much you understand of this subject matter that I have taught over here. You can also think of a different context, a different uh, example that we have seen before which is uh, in the case of a firm. So, as, as an employer you are interested in maximizing profit and um, while maximizing profit you do care about the productivity of the workers in, in, uh, in an office. So, one way that we can think of is that um, when workers come to office and then sp they spend a lot of time on work. So, this time spent on work increases their productivity, but then there is an opposite uh, story to this. I can also say that it is not the total amount of time that workers spend that increases their productivity, but how focused they are in that one hour or uh, half an hour or two hours that they spend while working that improves their productivity. So, even if you compare let us say two people one of them actually uh, comes to office for maybe eight hours the other one comes to office for only five hours, but it is possible in the end of the day that five hours person has a higher productivity than the uh, eight hour person, but the other way around is also true. So, we might be interested in this empirical um, question whether work hours improve productivity or your class attendance your attentiveness in class improves productivity or not or whether you can just learn the material that I give you end of the day and um, learn the material yourself instead of just listening to my lectures. So, given this background suppose that uh, what we find in data is a one unit change in the instrument z. So, we can think of any instrument for instance um, uh, suppose again suppose we were meeting in person in a particular class and I give you chocolates to be more attentive in my class or to attend my classes. So, if you can think of chocolate as a some kind of an incentive that I am giving you to attend the lecture or to be more attentive during the lecture and so on. So, in this case chocolate is some sort of an instrument. So, the instrument is associated with about 0.2 more hours of work or attention in class. So, if we could measure attention in some other way. So, we could also think of it as just um, whether you attend classes or not or the fraction of classes that you attend in a particular course. We could think of multiple ways of measuring work hours or attention and suppose that is related to a 500 unit increase in individual productivity or entry salary for a person. So, once again what we are saying over here is the link that z has to your productivity y and the relationship remember that we are interested in is y where y is productivity or your uh, productivity in class your performance in class or it could be your salary that depends on your uh, performance and how that is linked to this attention in class or your um, hours of work in office. Okay. And what we have estimated or what we are talking about in this first part over here is the effect that z has on y not the direct relationship of x on y, but rather the indirect relationship of z on y. Next, suppose this increase in productivity 
is an indirect effect of the increase in Z that led to an increase in work hours which in turn increases output. So, this is essentially uh, in this statement is implicit the assumptions of instrumental variables that we have seen before. That is the increase in productivity or the increase in Y which is productivity is an indirect effect of the increase in Z. So, when we are saying in the very first point that Z changes Y, all that we are saying is Z, this effect of Z to Y follows through X, but not directly through Z itself or not through any other channel, but only through X. So, the indirect effect of increase in Z that led to an increase in work hours, which in turn increases output. So, it follows that 0.2 hours of additional work is associated with 500 units. So, in this case we are writing 500 dollars uh, to reflect salary, but you can think of any other currency unit. So, it follows that 0.2 hours of additional work is associated with dollar 500 increase in output of a worker. So, then the causal estimate of beta is 2500. So, how do we get there? We basically are doing a very simple unitary method. So, all that we are saying is that um, if additional work of 0.2 hours is associated with 500 dollar salary increase or 500 dollar output increase, if we could let us say measure output in, in monetary terms, then what we are trying to ask here is how much does a 1 hour increase in work hour increase your salary by. So, what is this effect beta? So, what we have is what we are saying that if z increases by 1 unit, then your x increases by 0 0.02 units and your y increases by point uh, by 500 units. So, then because the effect of z on y is only through x, what we can say for sure in this particular situation is that an increase in x by 0 0.2 units increases y by 500 units. And from there just by using unitary method what you can say is that if x increases by 1 unit by how much does y increase and that in fact is what you are trying to estimate in this equation over here and the effect particularly of beta the true beta. So, this is one way of understanding how an IV or the instrumental variable z which is only correlated with x, but not directly correlated with y apart from through x helps you to retrieve the true parameter beta when the OLS parameter estimate of beta is actually a biased estimate. So, this remember is um, uh, once again this equation y equal to alpha plus beta x plus epsilon you could have estimated beta in an unbiased way in the situation that uh, you have an experiment where you experimentally affect x right or you experimentally put units of observations in the treatment or the control group. But what we are saying over here is that even in the absence of an experiment, suppose you have. So, for instance, uh, if we go back to this question of your class attendance and performance in, in this course, uh, we could think of an experiment where I take a group of 50 students who uh, have enrolled in my class and I I make them, I, I set up this experiment, uh, although of course, it would be ethically incorrect, but suppose in theory we could set up this experiment, we, I make half of them few, uh, which is 25 of them, I pick them randomly and make them come to my class. I mandate or I uh, ensure that they come to my class and the rest of the 50 of them which again is randomly picked, you have the equal probability of being in treatment and control group the rest of the 50 of uh, 25 of them I uh, uh, ask them not to attend my classes, but I give them the lecture materials that I will teach you in this particular class. So, what I am saying over here is that I randomly pick each one each uh, person in this uh, class of 50 students and either put them in the treatment group which is attending classes or put them in the control group which is not attending classes. 
Now, if this was an experiment that I could actually institute, I could take the mean difference in performance between the uh, group of students who I make, uh, who I ensure that they attend my classes and I take the average performance um, of the group of students who do not attend my classes, but who actually learn from my lecture notes that I give to them after let us say 10 classes, I, I do an, uh, do a te I, uh, I give you a test to actually measure your performance. So, this mean difference between the treatment and the control group would give me an effect or uh, the true effect of class attendance. But what I am saying here is that because it is ethically incorrect for me to go about um, uh, instituting such an experiment. So, I cannot really ask you to attend or not attend my classes. I can actually motivate you to attend my classes, but I cannot mandate that you do not attend my classes that would be wrong on my part. So, because I cannot institute such an experiment, it would be difficult to find the causal effect of uh, causal effect of class attendance on your performance. Now, in this particular situation, we can still look at observational data. So, let us say I have your information on your performance in various classes or even in my class and um, I know your attendance, overall attendance which you voluntarily decide whether to listen to my lectures or just read the notes end of the day and I also have information on your performance. Now, what I am saying over here is that instead of asking you to attend my classes, I give you an incentive. Suppose, if we were meeting in person, I could give you an incentive that I will give you a chocolate if you attend one of my classes. So, for every class that you attend uh, or every lecture that you attend, I will give you a chocolate. Now, if you like chocolates, you would end up coming to class, you might end up coming to class. So, what at least what I can say is that giving a chocolate increases your probability of attending the class as opposed to not giving a chocolate. So, that is why here chocolate is related to x which is your, your class attendance and um, is an instrument to change x that is why it is called the instrumental variable. So, given that I cannot do the experiment, I actually find out an instrument by which I can motivate you to attend classes by which I can uh, change your x and once you start attending classes or the group of people to whom I give the incentive and there is also a group of students, th these other 25 students I, mm, I do not give them the chocolate, I do not tell them that I will give you a chocolate, but I uh, only pick randomly 25 students and tell you that I will give you chocolate if you attend my classes. So, what I try to do is, I first try to see if I give you chocolates by how much does your class attendance improve and uh, th then I try to see if I give you chocolates by how much does your uh, performance in the, in the exam after 10 lectures improve. When I say how does it improve, what I am saying is what is the difference in your performance in the in the class test, had you been part of the group to whom I um, offered chocolates or had you been part of the group to which I did not offer chocolates. Now, once I have these two measures, which is exactly what we have in this example that we just discussed, once we have these two measures, the 500 and the 0 0.2. So, let us say your probability of attending classes increases by 20 percent if I give you chocolates, if I offer to give you chocolates. and um, if I could measure your performance, your performance in the class test improves by some 500 units. So, if that is the case, then what I am saying is due to giving my, uh, uh, due to this instrumenting of, uh, of chocolates, this is instrumental variable that I use over here, your performance improves and your probability of attending the class improves and because chocolates affect your performance in this example that I just gave you only through your class attendance, I can say that uh, this effect of class attendance and this effect of performance are uh, one to one uh, correlated in the sense that uh, th this point 0.2 hours increase in your class attendance or point uh, the 20 percent Im increase in probability of class attendance is leading to the 500 units improvement in your uh, output in your uh, performance. And from there we deduce uh, the causal estimate of beta, which is um, just as I said uh, through a unitary method. So, if 0.2 hours leads to a 500 units increase in y, then 
uh, one hour would effectively lead to a 2500 increase in output. So, this is one way of understanding uh, the derivation of the instrumental variable estimate. Let us say technical way of understanding the estimate is the following. So, once again this is the equation from where we start the mean deviation equation where y is a function of um, x, but now there is also an error term which depends on x. So, you could think of simultaneity problems or omitted variables which is leading uh, to, to, the, to the error term u depending on x. So, now if I take a total derivative something that you had uh, seen before what you have is if I take a total derivative of this equation what you end up getting is dy dx equal to beta plus du dx. Now, remember that this is the typical OLS the linear regression that we run and this OLS would give you a consistent estimate of beta if di du dx is equal to 0 because all you observe in data is this dy dx because you have information on y and you have information on x in the data and this dy dx is equal to the true parameter estimate beta only when du dx is equal to 0. Now, we come to a situation where du dx is not equal to 0. So, you uh, start with an instrumental variable which is uh, related to x and x leads to y in a situation where this u has an independent effect of y, but u also has an indirect effect on y through x or rather x has an indirect effect on y through u. So, in this case we are talking about the instrument z. So, now what we do is we take the total derivative with respect to z. So, dy dz now becomes beta times dx dz plus du dz. Right. So, we do not have du dx anymore, but now we end up having du dz. So, here as you can see we need the assumption of the IV, the exclusion restriction or the exogeneity assumption that du dx must be equal to 0. Right. So, this is essentially saying that z does not affect y because u is essentially the part of y uh, which is not explained by x. So, u essentially is a part of y uh, or uh, u essentially is uh, y in other words without the x part which is explain uh, which is explaining y. So, this du d, dz equal to 0 reflects the exogeneity condition. Now, this if this is equal to 0 what you are left with is beta times dx dz right. So, then your beta iv becomes dy dz divided by dx dz. Okay. So, this is what we have and th remember this is what we saw in the previous slide also. Your dy dz was 500 units and your dx dz was 0 0.2. Right. So, 500 divided by 0 0.2 which you got the 2500 as the beta iv. So, in notation what we have is beta i v the estimate of uh, beta uh, through using an instrumental variable approach is d y d z divided by d x d z which is essentially the covariance between y and z. z. So, if you ran a regression of uh, let us say y on z then this delta is the covariance between y and z and then if you ran a regression of x on z then this nu is essentially the covariance between x and z and when you take the ratio of the two the two covariances what you get is the iv estimator okay so all that remains is the consistent estimation of dy z dz and dx dz now, the obvious way to estimate dy dz is by the OLS regression of y on z which is this equation over here that we just wrote and the slope estimator would be z transpose z inverse z transpose y and this one is called again the reduced form some an idea that we have introduced before is because z is exogenous and 
as long as you have exogenous variables on the right hand side and you have a dependent variable y, this would be an redu a reduced form because there is no endogenous variable on the right hand side. And then we have the effect of z on x and this is called the first stage in, in the IV regression, in the IV estimation process. So, similarly estimate dx dz by OLS regression of x on z with slope estimate of z transpose z inverse z transpose x. So, then beta iv is simply this OLS estimate a combination of the covariance between z and x and z and y. So, as you see over here in this particular formula, all you do is put the covariance of z and y and take the ratio with respect to the covariance of z and x. So, then what you get by just algebraically manipulating this is z transpose x whole inverse z transpose y which takes you to the very first slide that we were discussing in terms of the formula for the IV estimator if you recall. So, this is what we are getting over here. So, this is exactly what you end up with in that particular slide when you take the ratio of the covariances between z and y and z and x right here. Now, the IV regression is also called the two stage least squares process. The reason why it is called two stage least squares is you have remember you have two stages. Once you are taking the estimation of z on x and then you are taking the estimation of z on y. So, when we actually perform the two stage least squares, how is it done? It is first what we do is we take the first stage which isolates the part of x that is uncorrelated with u. So, as we just saw what we are doing over here is to est is to regress x on z. Now, when you regress x on z what we are doing is trying to understand what is the part of x. So, let us say this whole thing is x, but we are trying to capture the part of x which is only explained by z. Okay, so, this is the part of x which is let us say explained by z. Now, this part of x which is explained by z by construct because z is not correlated with y is not correlated with y. Now, because z i is uncorrelated with u i where u i is uh, just to just for reference let us keep this equation in our minds because z i is uncorrelated with this structural error u i we have pi naught plus pi 1 z i uncorrelated with u i right. This is essentially the predicted value of x once you have estimated this first stage equation of x on z. We do not know pi naught of pi 1 of course, but we estimate this equation using OLS. So, once we have estimated pi naught and pi 1, what we have is the predicted value of x, x hat as pi naught hat plus pi 1 hat z. Okay. Now, once you have this predicted value of x, which is x hat, once again this is the part of x hat which is determined by z and hence it is not correlated with the structural error term u because z is not correlated with the structural error term u by definition by assumption. So, once you have x hat all that you need to do is run the second stage where the second stage is essentially the structural equation where you replace the actual values of x by the predicted value of x hat which is the, uh, by the predicted value x hat which is the predicted value of x. Okay? Because once you have replaced x with x hat remember that x hat is not correlated with u. Because x hat is uncorrelated with u i in large samples, the beta i v is unbiased. So, in the chocolate performance example that I just gave you, what would this mean? It would mean that this is the structural equation that I am interested in. 
I am interested in the effect that um, your effort has on performance. So, in this case you can think of effort as attendance in the class or whether you attend my lectures or your uh, attention uh, once you attend the class. So, any any example that you can think of. So, suppose I just stick to attendance in class and performance. So, what I am saying over here is that whether your attendance in class which is reflected in effort leads to a better performance or not. What we have taken over here is log effort and log performance. So, then uh, what I have as z are chocolates. So, I give you chocolates or not, I offer you chocolates or not. So, whether you get chocolates to be attentive, attentive in class. So, then the first stage essentially points towards the regression of effort on chocolates. So, I have effort as the outcome and I regress that on chocolates okay. and I take I estimate delta using OLS and then I have the predicted effort. So, this step essentially isolates the change in effort that arise due to the offering of chocolates and hence it uh, isolates the part of effort which is not correlated with the structural error term u. Then once we have this what we do is we take the second stage. The second stage is nothing but the, the structural equation where so this would be a log over here. So, we take the structural equation and instead of taking log effort what we do is we just replace log effort by the predicted value from the first stage because the predicted value is not correlated with u anymore. So, what you see over here this is just for simplicity I have written effort instead of log effort uh, you can just uh, replace uh, um, effort by log effort and performance by log performance over here, but just for understanding for simplicity we uh, restrict to this particular equation right now. Uh, so, what we are saying over here is that we start with a measure of performance and the structural equation where it is regressed on effort, but now after the first stage we replace effort with this predicted value of effort. So, we have manipulated the equation added this beta times um, effort hat, but because we have added this per part we also need to subtract it from the structural equation. So, we subtract effort hat times beta and we have this part which is beta times effort from the structural equation. So, what we end up with is this equation over here as the second stage where we are using effort hat instead of effort. So, the regression so this is essentially the regression counterpart of what you have seen before in the demand supply framework where we were using supply shifters to trace out the demand curve. So, let us take one more example to understand the concept of IV or the estimation procedure of IV better which is uh, we go back to our agricultural uh, demand function estimation. We have the agricultural let us say suppose we are interested in the quantity demanded of rice and how that changes with the price of rice. One second we have taken a log transformed model, we have taken the log price and log quantity demanded. Now, we have discussed this before that uh, rainfall can be used as a good IV because rainfall is likely to be not correlated with u, rainfall is less likely to affect the quantity demanded of rice, but at the same time because rainfall is a supply shock it is likely to affect prices through a change in supply of rice. So, the first stage is regression of log price on rain. So, what you do over here is you take log price as the outcome variable and run it regress it on rainfall ok. Then you get an OLS estimate of delta which is delta hat and OLS estimate of gamma which is gamma hat and given that you can 
predict the log price. Now, once you have the log price hat, it isolates the changes in price that arise from supply. So, this is the supply shifter that we were talking about, right. So, what we are using over here is rainfall, which is a sort of supply shifter, it shifts the supply curve, and in the process, you see how price changes. But this change in price due to the rainfall, due to the supply shifter, does not have a direct impact on uh, quantity demanded of rice. So, you use this part, the log price hat in the second stage regression, which is a transformed version of the structural regression or the structural equation over here. So, now instead of log price, the log price hat, the predicted value of log price. And once again, you just manipulate because what you had originally is beta times log price. Now, because you have added this terms beta times log price hat, you need to deduct that part, uh, part also from the equation and this is what you have as your second stage regression. So, that is why sometimes, uh, so in this case, this is called the two stage least squares because you are running two least squares. First, you are running the first stage which is the least square, you run an OLS and you take the estimate from there and use it in the second stage to run the second stage equation. So, you run the estimation in two stages. So, just to revisit the IV assumptions that we have discussed, which are very important in retrieving the causal parameter in an IV estimation that you saw in the previous two examples. So, the first one is that the instrument is as good as randomly assigned that is independent of potential outcomes conditional on covariates. Now, we will revisit this part of conditional on con uh, covariates, which is similar to the idea of conditional randomization. So, this is basically once again saying that if it is randomly assigned, if it satisfies the exogeneity condition, then the only reason for the relationship between y and z is the first stage. And as long as you can guarantee that, you can take the covariances of y and z and x and z to get to the IV estimate of the effect of x on y. Okay. And you of course, need to ensure that z and x are correlated to make the IV estimation meaningful. Because recall that if you do not have x and z correlated, if we get back to the formula for the IV. So, this is a ratio of the covariance of y and z and the covariance of x and z. So, of course, you need this to be not equal to 0 because if this is equal to 0, then the IV estimate does not exist. So, the existence of IV estimate is ensured by this non-zero correlation between x and z, which is the relevance condition that you have seen before. And the another way of seeing this is basically that the first assumption is used to have an unbiased estimate of the effect of z on y and the second assumption is needed to ensure the existence of the IV estimate, so that the denom denominator is not driven to 0. So, what we would do next now that we understand the assumptions of IV and uh, the derivation of IV. We will revisit a paper that we have seen before when we were uh, talking about experiments and the average treatment effect. This paper was about uh, marketing complex financial products in emerging markets, evidence from rainfall insurance in India. So, um, what we had done is we had used an experiment in the, um, what we have seen before is where we used an experiment to retrieve the causal parameter of whether financial literacy training leads to an improvement in insurance take up. Now, what we are going to do uh, using the instrumental variables is see how an experiment can be used as an instrumental variable to recover the structural relationship. Now, recall that uh, what we had seen previously in the paper by Gaurav et al, uh, this paper, it offered rainfall insurance and financial literacy program to 600 small scale farmers in India. And uh, the what they measured was the effect of financial literacy training and six marketing treatments using a randomized control trial. So, just to remind you 
uh, what the experiment was about. Remember what they were doing is they went to three coastal districts of Gujarat and what they were interested in understanding is why insurance take up weather insurance in this particular case why is weather insurance take up so low among farmers in India and they were concentrating this particular part of Gujarat in the three coastal districts and what they did was they took 600 farmers and one of the motivations for this was that farmers uh, theoretically speaking um, in economics we believe that one of the reasons could be that the farmers uh, do not understand the insurance products or do not understand the idea that you should insure yourself against shocks and they possibly are affected by the price of insurance products and they are possibly affected by the fact that if I pay out a premium and I do not receive a weather shock I might not end up getting any uh, payment in the end. So, I, I, I lose some money in the end. So, they uh, in the in the effort to understand which mechanism is at play what the authors did was to take 600 farmers and uh, randomly pick 300 of them and um, offer a financial literacy training program to them. So, they, they were offered to attend some classes on financial literacy training where financial literacy training involved giving them idea or giving them lessons on interest rate on uh, compound interest rates on um, on insurance on the idea of the insurance product and also the uh, not only the benefits, but also the pitfalls of buying an insurance product. And in addition to this financial literacy program what the authors did was also to introduce six different marketing uh, programs. One uh, was um, the giving them a demonstration of how rainfall is related to soil moisture the exact metric which is used by the insurance companies to pay out in case of a shock. Then the other marketing technique was to give them the premium back in case there was no payout or in case there was no shock received by the farmers the experimenters promised the farmers that they would return the premium. So, this will help you to understand whether it is a price of the insurance product that is stopping the farmers from buying the insurance product and given uh, these uh, six different uh, and, and the combinations of each of these that um, was offered by the experimenters. In this setting what they did was they tried to understand whether financial literacy training had an impact on insurance take up. Now, what the authors found if you recall this is the table that we had seen before where or the authors are regressing insurance take up the dependent variable on invitation to training. So, what the authors are doing actually over here in terms of uh, regression equations is they are randomly assigning financial literacy training to farmers and this random assignment facilitates the measurement of the causal impact of financial training on rainfall insurance take up. The structural relation that we are interested in over here is whether insurance take up is related to attendance in the financial literacy training class. Because the implicit assumption here is that if you attend the class then your understanding of financial literacy training increases. However, what we saw in the table uh, just now and uh, we are going to revisit that and what we have seen previously in the experiment when we were discussing the experiment is the reduced form that is the authors were regressing invitation to training on insurance take up because remember that insurance uh, so, so this invitation to training is actually the random assignment. So, the authors take 600 farmers and randomly assign each farmer to attend or not attend financial literacy training. Now, this assignment is random, but once I have assigned a farmer to a financial literacy training program to this to attend a particular class, it is totally up to the farmer whether to actually attend the class or not. In other words, what we are talking about here is if you recall one of the criticisms of an experiment is the non-compliance part that even if I assign a farmer or a, a unit of observation over here to the treatment group, the farmer might not stick to this assignment, 
might not comply to this assignment and can actually not attend the class in the end. On the other hand, in the control group are farmers to whom we do not offer this financial literacy training, but even within that group to whom we do not offer the training, there could be some very motivated farmers who still end up attending the financial literacy training. So, that would be non-compliance in the control group. Now, what we are going to see next is how an instrumental variable approach helps us to retrieve the structural parameter over here even when there is non-compliance. Now, see what actually non-compliance means over here is that non-compliance means that while invited to training is random, actual attendance is not random anymore because when it comes to actual attendance, the farmers themselves choose whether to attend or not. Now, in the presence of non-compliance, attendance is not random, but invited to training continue to be random because that was the initial random assignment. So, going back to the table that we had seen before in experiments, in the first column is the relationship between invited to training and insurance take up a reduced form approach over here because invited to train by construct is a random assignment and hence exogenous. So, what you found is that uh, or what the authors found is that invited to training leads to a 5.3 percent increase in insurance take up and in column 2 what the authors have done is to control for or also include in other words the money back guarantee that is the uh, one of the marketing treatments then the weather forecast the another marketing treatment whether the weather forecast were given to the farmers and the mm demo which is basically the metric if you recall by which the insurance company pays out to the farmers in case of a shock that is the relationship between the soil moisture and the amount of rainfall and um, in the third column, they also included additional characteristics of the farmers, which is the gender, the age, the household size and land holding. Now, this table we have discussed before, but the main point to note in this table is that because the experiment was a randomized experiment and the randomization uh, was valid in, in the sense that it went well, all these coefficients that is of interest over here, these are all equivalent. So, there is no statistical difference between the coefficient on invited to train in column 1, 2 and 3. So, effectively what we have is a causal estimate of the reduced form parameter delta 1. Okay? But remember finally, what we are interested in is this structural equation where in the structural equation the delta 1 that we have is the parameter on attendance which is reflecting the relationship between attendance and insurance take up. You could also think of different parameters in this reduced form over here that we have written. I mean we have just included the same parameters although you could also write it in uh, t uh, ideally you would write it using different parameters maybe alpha naught plus um, new one invited to train. plus v i. Okay. So, getting back to the idea of non-compliance for financial education not everyone ac assigned to the financial literacy program actually attended the treatment and hence there is non-compliance. So, the reduced form coefficient for the invitation to financial education is likely to be less than the effect of financial education itself. Why, why is it likely to be less? It is likely to be less because if you uh, consider what is happening over here, I have let us say I start with a group of 600 farmers out of which I randomly pick 300 farmers and ask them to attend a financial literacy program. Now, what the uh, authors show us is that this attendance to or, or the um, assignment to financial literacy training, this treatment has a positive impact on insurance take up. So, which means that if you were assigned uh, to, in, uh, to the financial literacy program, you have a 5.3 percent higher likelihood of buying an insurance, uh, the weather insurance product. Now, 
the point is that because not everyone that I assigned um, the, uh, the literacy program to actually attended the literacy program. So, let us say within the th uh, group of 300 farmers who were given the treatment only let us say 80 percent of them actually stuck to the treatment by while 20 percent of them did not attend any of the lectures in the financial literacy training program. In that case what we are saying over here is that the effect that we find in the reduced form of this 5.3 percent increase is coming from the 80 percent of those farmers who attended the program. But suppose 100 percent of the farmers actually end up attending the program, then you might find a higher take up percentage than the 5.3 percent, right? Because there would be more farmers who are trained into financial literacy and hence more farmers might understand the weather insurance product and purchase the weather insurance product in the end. So, hence what we are saying over here is that the reduced form coefficient for the invitation to financial education is likely to be less than the effect of the financial education itself. The instrumental variable regression could scale up the reduced form estimates to account for non-compliance and help us retrieve the structural parameter. So, how do you use the instrumental variable uh, estimation over here? You would first run the first stage, which is the effect of invitation to training on attendance. So, recall the structural equation is y on x, where x is attendance in financial literacy training and y is insurance take up. And you are using as z whether a person or a farmer was invited to training or not. Okay, so, z is the instrumental variable that we are using. So, in the first in the first stage regression what you would do is you would regress x on z, take the predicted value of x which is attendance hat and then use this x hat in the second stage regression to retrieve the IV estimate of beta which is um, beta hat IV. Okay. So, in the second stage what you are doing is you are regressing insurance take up on attendance hat. And this is what the authors did in the paper and uh, this table shows you the results from the IV estimation. In the first column, we have the result that we saw in the previous table which is the OLS when you only have invited to training the financial literacy training without any other marketing intervention. So, when I regress invited to training on insurance take up. What I find is there is an increase in 5.3 percent in terms of insurance take up. And then when you run the IV second stage what you find is that attending financial literacy training leads to a higher insurance take up rate. Particularly if you attend financial literacy training then you are more likely to purchase ins insurance by about 8 percent which is higher than the OLS estimate that we find in column 1. And how do we arrive at this 0 0.08 um, IV estimate? We have the first stage of the IV estimate, which is the regression of attended financial training on invited to train. So, the covariance between x and z and then we have the second stage where we use this covariance between x and z to estimate the structural relationship between y the insurance take up and x the attended financial training or not. And by using the first stage um, relationship between x and z we are able to retrieve the structural parameter of the effect of class attendance in financial training on insurance take up. So, this table essentially shows you 
the analogous uh, columns to what you saw before which, which were the reduced form. So, this table is a analogous to the reduced form that you saw before, where in the first column we only have the IV estimate of invited to train. That is what you have is you have use invited to training as an IV for attendance in financial literacy program. So, that is the x that we are talking about and this is the coefficient from that estimate where at uh, where the x is attendance in the financial literacy program. In the second column in addition to financial literacy program you also introduce the other marketing programs and then in column 3 in addition to the marketing programs, you also introduce the other characteristics. Once again, what you see over here is that this coefficient remains statistically the same between columns 1, 2 and 3, meaning that uh, these other programs or these other characteristics do not change the coefficient on the IV estimate of the effect of class attendance in financial training program on insurance take up which also implies that uh, the experiment that was run the randomization to you know, assign an inv individual into financial training program or not assign an individual into financial training program was actually randomly done. So, this was uh, one of the examples to see how instrumental variables might help you to recover the structural parameter in the presence of non-compliance in an experimental setup. So, even if you have an, so first thing that we learnt is that um, in order to retrieve a, a causal parameter, we might want to set up an experiment. And then I said that uh, in, the, in the situation that you are unable to set up an experiment, you can still retrieve or you can still ask many causal questions based on observational data as long as you can find an instrumental variable for instance, which is one of the techniques that can be used to recover the, uh, the causal parameter. Then we are now saying that even when you actually are able to run an experiment, if there is non-compliance, then you are unable to retrieve the structural parameter just by comparing means. But you f if you are able to use an instrumental variable which is the randomization itself, then you are still able to recover the structural parameter of interest in this case the effect of attendance class attendance in the financial literacy program on insurance take up. So, you are still able to recover the structural parameter by using an instrumental variable approach in addition to this uh, experiment that you had set up. So, just to summarize what we have done so far in this uh, uh, today's lecture is uh, we first uh, tried to understand how to derive an instrumental variable estimate. So, instead of going into the technical derivation what we did was to understand if you have a randomized experiment let us say which you can use as an instrument then you can use an in unitary method to actually recover the instrumental variable estimate which, which is uh, what we are saying is from there we went to this uh, ratio of covariances that is first you understand what is the impact of z on y a reduced form and then you take the other reduced form which is also the first stage which is the effect of z on x where z is the instrumental variable and once you have these two causal estimates. So, given that z is exogenous and given that um, it is uh, randomly allocated. So, you can recover these causal estimates of z on x and z on y and once you have these two estimates you can take the ratio of these two estimates which would be your instrumental variable estimate. Now, for the instrumental variable estimate to be meaningful, we need the two assumptions of the instrumental variable that we have seen previously. And you see now why the assumptions are so useful and so important, which is one is the exogeneity condition. So, given that there is an exogeneity condition, the only effect that z has on y is through x which means that the covariance of y and z that you estimate is coming due to the relationship of z and x and not due to any, uh, any direct effect of z on y. And hence you can use this covariance between y and z to recover the effect of x on y. And then in the denominator you have the relationship between x and z 
and unless this correlation is um, is positive or negative unless you have a significant correlation over here between x and z which is uh, if you have in in other words if you have a zero correlation between x and z then your denominator is driven down to zero and the existence of the iv estimate is uh, questionable right so both of the assumptions you see how they are very important to uh, to uh, to estimate the iv coefficient so this is the first thing that we learned the second thing is we revisited the uh, the paper that uh, that uh, essentially discussed the effect of uh, a financial literacy program on rainfall insurance take up and then what we discussed is is in the previous paper when we were we were in in this paper previously when we were discussing on the only the experiment part then we could only retrieve the reduced form parameter that is if you were invited to the financial literacy program the effect of this assignment treatment assignment on your um, uh, insurance take up but what we might be and what we are interested in in this case is whether you attended the financial literacy program and the impact of that attendance on insurance take up now the problem is that if attendance is due to or is affected by non compliance that i assigned you to the treatment but you did not comply with that assignment you chose either to attend or not attend in that case the instrumental variable can come into rescue of the structural parameter of the effect of attendance on uh, insurance take up given this we now end today's lecture and in the next class what we would in the next lecture what we would do is we would take up the idea of conditional randomization to see how instrumental variable is linked to this idea of conditional randomization and how a conditional randomization uh, how in the case of a conditional randomization your iv equation needs to be adjusted thank you very much for attending to the, today's lecture